great balls of fire now on BBC One in the sky at night. Good evening. For this programme, we're going to continue with the fascinating subject of asteroid collisions, which we started off last month. After all, you know, our Earth is about four and a half thousand million years old, and it can be bombarded. Our solar system is made up of one star, the Sun, the main planets and their satellites, and various smaller bodies, such as comets and asteroids, comets mainly icy, asteroids much more rocky, and collisions can occur. In fact, there's a well-marked theory that about 65 million years ago, we were hit by a massive impactor that changed the entire climate and wiped out the dinosaurs. And what happened once could happen again. And we do have positive proof now, because our, not only are the craters here, we, in 1994, we saw the impact of a comet upon the giant planet Jupiter. Fireballs the size of the Earth. We saw the, the scars left in Jupiter's gases. Of course, they were not permanent, but the Earth is a solid body, and there are meteorite craters here. For example, the famous meteor crater in Arizona is one. What about recent impacts? Well, the famous one in June 1908. Something hit Tunguska in Siberia and blew pine trees flat over a very wide area. Plenty of people saw this Siberian object come down, and it must have been quite terrifying. But it landed in a virtually uninhabited area, therefore there are no casualties, but the reindeer did suffer very badly, and of course the forest was devastated. So we are definite danger of an asteroidal or cometary impact. Now I'd like to welcome again here uh, our guests, once again Jay Tate of Space Guard and Limbitopic MP. Now there are two kinds of PHOs or potentially hazardous objects, and these are comets and asteroids. So Comets first, uh, Limbit, you're an expert here. Uh, comets are basically big icy snowballs, dirty snowballs, a lot of uh, water ice there probably, maybe some other kinds of uh, solid ices as well, uh, and maybe a little bit of rock. But what's interesting about them, what distinguishes them, is the elliptical nature of their orbits. Uh, and they come from two places. Uh, they come from the Kuiper Belt, which is still in the solar system, but in the outer reaches. And they come from the Oort Cloud, which is 10,000 times further from the Sun, maybe even 100,000 times further from the Sun than we are. Uh, the reason that we need to be concerned about those is because they don't come along very often. And we have to be prepared, if you like, uh, whenever they do come into the solar system, because they might catch us unawares. Uh, we all remember the famous comet hale bopp That was a beauty. And that will be back in several thousand years from now. That's right. So those are comets. Then, of course, there are asteroids. Now, most of the asteroids stick to a belt between Mars and Jupiter, and they're out of the way. But there are some that are not. So asteroids, please, Jay. Right. Well, as, as you say, the, the, the vast majority of asteroids are confined to the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. But there are some fairly significant families of, of asteroids, the Apollos, the Atens, and the Amours, for instance, which do have orbits that either cross that of the Earth or have the potential to cross that of the Earth in the future. And these are the PHOs, potentially hazardous objects. That's right. A potentially hazardous object is defined as an object that uh, crosses the Earth's orbit at a distance of less than 7.5 million kilometres and is bigger than 150 metres in diameter. As we said last month, uh, more than 270 have been found by now, but there must be many more than that. Oh, How yes. many do you reckon? Well, at a conservative estimate, we can certainly double that figure straight away, uh, because we know that we've only detected less than half of the, the near-Earth asteroids. Uh, I would say probably two to three times that figure. Would you agree with that? I'm assuming that you don't mind giving a conservative estimate. Well, I, I think I'll be more liberal in my estimates <laughs> and say it's probably near 2,000, I think. But of course, uh, even though we both uh, study this and, and Jay works at it virtually full time, uh, we're in the realms of guesswork. And one of the reasons we're here is because we want to put more objective uh, basis for, of information by really tracking the sky and seeing what's up there. As we've said, um, there's a very well-supported theory that around 65 million years ago, there was a major impact and caused such a change of the climate that it wiped out the dinosaurs. Now, not everybody agrees with that, but um, I know you do, Jay. Well, I think the evidence for, for the impact scenario is very, very strong, because what we, we find in the geological record 
is that if you dig down, you find layers of rock with dinosaur fossils. You then find uh, a very, very thin layer of rock which contains a large quantity of a metal called iridium. Now, iridium is very rare on the Earth, but it's very common to find it in asteroids and comets. Then above that thin layer in the rocks, we find no dinosaur fossils whatsoever. But one thing worries me, a much earlier extinction in the Permian period, no iridium there, or not, not, not the same amount. There is evidence now beginning to mount, uh, either for ir iridium, a certain, a, a certain amount of iridium has been found in, in the Permian extinction layer, but there are other indicators as well uh, that, that that too was caused by an impact. And the, the focus is beginning to move in now uh, to a large crater uh, that's located in the, the southern Atlantic Ocean. It's partly underwater, isn't it? Uh, well, that, that, the, the, the Permian one is, is totally underwater. The, 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 the crater from the impact that we think killed the dinosaurs is, is half underwater and half under land, but the whole thing is buried under about a kilometre of silt and mud. Well, the impact itself must have been devastating, but there were many side effects too. That's right, and for me it's the side effects, the total package of what happens when, say, a 10 kilometre object hits the Earth that convinces me that what Jay says is right, that the impact can have all the uh, extinction level uh, consequences that we've discussed. First of all, uh, what happens when a 10 kilometre object hits the Earth is you get a heat flash which will incinerate just about everything in the line of sight. Secondly, uh, on impact, there's a seismic wave which goes across the entire globe for about one hour. It'll circumnavigate the glo globe in an hour. Then thirdly, you've got this huge splash of molten lava, dust, debris going into the atmosphere and spreading out from uh, the point of impact. Uh, of course, you add all that together and you're going to have a global fire where the biomass is literally uh, burning away and uh, woe betide any animal that uh, gets in the way. What about a sea impact? Well, a sea impact on top of all of that, which you'll still get, you also will have an enormous tidal wave, uh, a tsunami as it's called, which could be hundreds or even thousands of meters high, uh, which will sweep way inland and once again devastate uh, through its massive momentum and its speed of four or five hundred miles per hour perhaps. Well, there's one other thing that does happen. Uh, the dust doesn't come down straight away. It can stay in the atmosphere together with all the smoke caused uh, from the fires. Uh, and that can literally blanket out the sun so you get a period of darkness lasting months or even years. And that causes a breakdown in the ecosystem. And that's why I suspect that seven-tenths of life really was wiped out by the impact uh, 65 million years ago. And how long would the effects last, Jay? Well, nobody knows. It's not something we've tried. Um, certainly the, the dust veil that, that Lembit was talking about would blot out the sun for a period of years, possibly even decades. We, mm -hmm. we can go that yeah. far. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is, once that dust then filters out of the atmosphere and the sun can reach the ground again, uh, there's no ozone there. No. That's gone. So the ultraviolet light reaching the ground reaches what they um, rather politely call genetically damaging levels. Mm -hmm. So we've got problems even after the, uh, the nuclear winter, if you like. Also, the atmosphere will have a considerable carbon dioxide excess because of all the burning that's gone on and also because acid rain will have been formed and fallen and of course acid on limestone or chalk causes the production of carbon dioxide so going from very cold when the sun's blocked out to a massive greenhouse effect and potentially very hot so this swing from cold to hot will really stress the environment not very nice, because uh, don't forget, um, some PHOs are larger than 10 kilometres or 6 miles, so let's go up the scale. Well, uh, now we're talking about the things which are hard to imagine. If you, if you go all the way up, about 3.9 billion years ago, an object perhaps almost the size of Mars hit the Earth and splashed so much debris into space that the Earth may have had a ring around it, uh, maybe in orbit about 10,000 miles off the surface, that eventually coalesced into the Moon. So the moon itself was possibly caused by a devastating impact on the Earth. The other thing what, that which would have happened if the object really was that big was it would probably have melted the entire surface of the planet. So while it may be possible, well, it is possible for life to survive a 10-kilometer object, if you're talking about a 150 or 200-kilometer object, you're probably talking about very close to the end of life.
The effects are certainly going to be dramatic, to put it very mildly. We know these things have hit us in the past, but let's now try and get some hard and fast facts as far as we can. Jay, what do you think the risks are of our being hit by a sizable impactor in the foreseeable future? Well, as we've said before, that all of the numbers here have a, have a large uncertainty attached to them, but in general, we would expect something about the size of the Tunguska impact to happen once or twice per century. As an example, in the last century, that's the 20th century, we had probably three at least of that size. If we go up to the one kilometre size uh, impactor, we would expect one of those to hit on a statistical time scale of about 100,000 years. Now, that doesn't mean to say once one's hit, we then have to wait for 100,000 years for the next yeah. one. It means that over the whole life of the Earth, the average is 100,000 years. If we go up in size again to the size of the object that probably uh, did for the dinosaurs, uh, then we're looking at timescales of, of, of 100 million years or so. So we're looking at events that are, are rare on human timescales, but of very high consequence. Well, the answer is don't panic, but of course it could happen. And, uh, well, I was asked some time ago what I would do if we knew of a PHO approaching us of sizable dimensions and was certainly going to hit us. What would I do? I would say, repeat very slowly after me, our father. <laughs> on the other <laughs> hand, Lembit, quite seriously, if we do see one of these things coming in time, is there anything we can do? There are. Uh, basically, we can actually, with modern technology, with today's technology, divert these objects as long as we know that they're coming our way. We need to have plenty of notice, ideally a few decades, uh, but we don't have the chance of doing anything unless we set up an international space guard project, if you like, with a series of telescope works, telescopes tracking the whole sky. And you're involved in this, aren't you? Well, that's why I'm here, in fact. Uh, working with Jay, I brought the whole matter up in the Houses of Parliament and uh, managed to convince uh, a minister called John Battle initially that uh, this was something they had to take on board. And I'm glad to say, subsequently, the government uh, did uh, respond to our request for an investigation, the Near-Earth Object Task Force, uh, which reported and confirmed the claims that we've been making on the program. What about other governments? Other governments uh, really re focus on just the United States of America. There isn't any other country that's doing significant research. So it's just the UK and the US at the moment. But that's one reason why I would ask uh, our viewers to write to their MP and uh, exhort them to support this campaign. And secondly, viewers might want to wish to join uh, the Space Card UK project uh, and that's an organization which Jay Tate runs and has had a lot of uh, success I think in promoting. In fact it was Jay who got me active uh, even uh, uh, just a few years ago. Right Jay, we see one of these things coming and uh, saying what do we do? Well it very much depends on how much notice we've got. We've given enough notice I mean. If we can have say 20, 30 years of notice oh, yeah. then the first thing we need to do is find out how the objects put together. By that I mean we know what asteroids and comets are made of, but what we don't know is how they're put together. Are they solid? Are they just flying rubble piles? Have they got cracks? Have they got voids and so on? Well, some are. I mean, Matilda, for example, is a, that's, a, that's a porous asteroid, but the Eros is definitely solid. Absolutely. And this is why we'd need to do that sort of reconnaissance, because it would obviously have a, a very great bearing on how we then deal with the object. There are some people who suggested that the best thing is then to simply blow the thing to pieces. That wouldn't work, surely. This would be fatal. No. Um, well, we end up, uh, as I often put it, turning a cannonball into a cluster bomb. Uh, it, it, not, not good at all. A much better solution is, in effect, to nudge the thing out of yeah, the way. Okay. And there's a number of ways we can think about doing that. Uh, the first and most obvious way is by using an explosive charge. Um, it would clearly have to be a little bit more than a chemical explosive, so we are looking at a nuclear uh, device, though not, of course, a weapon in this context, that when exploded near to the object would cause the surface to boil, to outgas, to spoil off, therefore providing thrust in the opposite direction. And it doesn't all have to be done at once. It can be done incrementally, bit by bit by bit. If you've got time. If you've got the time. This is why, as Lembit said, we have to have a surveillance system in place. Let me ask you one more question. We know that Eros is not a PHA, it doesn't come within the Earth's orbit, but the Eros sized thing is nearly 20 miles long and pretty solid. Uh, if we saw one of these on a collision course, do we, at this very moment, have enough know how to divert it? Um, 
without being boring, I go back to how much notice have we got. If we've got less than about five to ten years of notice, then I would suggest that the best course of action is the one you postulated, <laughs> and we plunge to our knees in supplication. If we have more than that, then I believe that there, there is the will and the technology to do it. As an example, the Americans went from a standing start to the moon in less than ten years. Do you think, Levitt, we are doing enough even now? I'm sure that we're not doing enough. Uh, in fact, in the last three years, as we've been running this campaign, it's been clear to me that the public is now on board. They recognize there's an infrequent but very serious risk here. So the challenge now is to get governments to recognize this as a good investment. Think of it as an insurance policy. It would cost about £80 million altogether for the world to track most of these objects, and perhaps something in the region of £4,000 million to have an insurance policy to divert these objects or to put it another way, the global insurance policy would cost less than a pound per person and we think that's good value for money. We've talked about the dangers and the possible effects and the insurance policy. So far as that's concerned, Levitt, how far down that road have we gone? I'd say in the UK we've done pretty well. Uh, on account of the campaign we've run in Parliament and outside it, I do feel that the, the general public, the media and politicians are now taking this threat seriously. So the next steps for me are to encourage Tony Blair to bring this up as an item for the G8 summit, uh, and I've already asked uh, a question on that in Parliament. And secondly, to go to the United States, probably with Jay, to see if we can get some sort of an alliance between ourselves and Congress. So all of that's going on in Parliament. And then here in the UK, of course, there's Space Guard. Space Guard certainly is very powerful. Well, we like to think so. Uh, of course, the key thing about any Space Guard program is that it has to be international. It's, it's an international problem, therefore the solution must also be international. So we're taking a lot of time and effort at the moment to, to internationalize the program, to get as many countries on board as we can. But in addition to that, one of the things we're doing is also setting up the Space Guard Center in Mid Wales, and we hope to open that at the beginning of October. Where is that exactly? It's actually on just about on the England-Wales border, uh, very near to Lembit's constituency, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, it's about 15 miles uh, west of Ludlow to a town called Knighton. And what kind of equipment will you have there? Well, we've already got a 13-inch refracting telescope. We've got a number of other telescopes. We have earth science uh, equipment, a planetarium, a camera obscura. It'll be a good place to go. And that really will be a centre. So I think now we'd better try and evaluate this. We don't want to alarm people. We know the chances of a major impact are slight. They're not nil. We're trying to do something about it. But um, I think it is important to alert people. Would you agree on that one? Absolutely. Yes, it's exactly right. And I think that once people hear the facts, then they do come on board and we can get a rational solution to a genuine problem. We've talked about the international collaboration, America, United States and Britain. What about the Far East, Japan, Russia? Are they coming in too? Well, I would say that one of, one of the, the growing obs obs observational programs is actually in Japan, uh, the Besai Observatory. And the Chinese have actually stated a, a, a great interest and are spending quite a lot of money on building a telescope. Yeah. Uh, I'd just add to that that the industrialized countries have the most to lose in the event of a serious impact. And that's one reason I hope that the G8 countries will start working together on this. Well, one thing I do hope, if we do have a major impact, let's hope we cope better than the dinosaurs did. Jay, Lembit, thank you very much. And uh, if we do have a, a major impact before our next program, please accept our apologies in advance. <laughs> Now, don't forget our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash guide night and CFAX page 620. And um, comets and asteroids permitting, we'll be back next month. Good night. <laughs>